Oh, hello and hello. When last I left you hanging, exploring the notion that Kern County, the deeper, more insidious, hidden parts of Kern County, perhaps, that I'm theorizing lead to a darker picture, more sinister place, a place of exploitation, a place of selfishness, greed, and above all, dishonesty, and the harvesting of human lives and labors for a larger purpose that has nothing to do with those people like we are. Tiny cogs in a wheel that doesn't serve us. Even at its most removed, far out view, the machine that we are the, the cogwheels in isn't for us. The machine is for something else, some other struggle. And that's the way I'm decreasingly feeling, increasingly feeling more despondent about this. I want to preface this with the acknowledgement that there can be some sensitivity regarding some of the postulations that I throw out. No one wants to believe, for example, or hear that maybe their grandfather didn't exist or didn't exist in the way that we're told or some of the legends that we know, the stories we've known about our past are not true. And my intention isn't to stomp over people's emotions and fly through with wanting regard to anyone's feeling. And I also want to say that I am operating under the full assumption that I could be completely wrong about it anything at any given time there's also a lot of talk sometimes taken to ludicrous extremes i believe about fake people clones npcs robots and there's probably some truth to all of it but i like to strip that down a little bit it doesn't necessarily have to be so extreme and for that as an example i turn to the witness protection program witness protection program as evidenced by interviews and things i've seen from mafia members where they're given a new identity after they cooperate with the government a new identity and it makes me wonder is there a quota when they're creating these new identities how does that work? Do they have a deal with the social security department? The social security department assigns these people and these numbers and there's a particular number they create a year or can they be created on a whim like that? Or do they have a pool already of pre-created identities that they give? I mean, social security number and name and backstory and all that. Or do they create them on the fly? Are they people that are, have been passed, deceased? Do they recycle the numbers and the names and the ideas? These are just thoughts that come into my head, but it's not really difficult to imagine how you could easily if you extend that benefit to criminals and murderers who just say rat on their friends, rat on their co co-workers, and they get this sort of stipend, they get a new life, they get a new start, they get you know, an apartment, a car, whatever it is. If they'll do that for common criminals, what wouldn't they do for one of their own? I mean, their own family members. For example, let's say you are a uh, you're the son of a very wealthy family and you don't seem to have any particular drive maybe you've got yourself in a little bit of trouble you know petty crimes and and then one day you receive a phone call and it says hey the way things are going your reputation's tarnished check it out we get you to agree to do something cooperate with us on something this identity of yours will be killed you'll be killed off you'll be in prison for life you'll be sent away you'll be out of sight out of mind dead to the world that knows you in exchange you'll be given all the money you can ever want a new identity a new house in a different country different part of the world i think there would be plenty of takers for that if someone ever sees you and recognize you on the off chance of that they'd be like hey you got a doppelganger over there in uh, new mexico i met him in jamaica i don't i'm saying these are these are hypothetical situations but i'm just saying using your imagination on what we already know to be true it isn't that difficult to imagine that there can be fake people it isn't that difficult to imagine that there can be people that change your identity get found guilty of a crime let's say and then and disappear send his life in prison and then really they've just struck a deal and they've started over new somewhere else if i should say this next part well i have a family member who was in my opinion he was in trap he was he was a uh, trapped i don't know the situation very well we weren't we were not close I just literally not close in, in location or anything and and uh he was entrapped by the law in a way did a little bit of time and then when he was when they tried to basically extradite him to get him to do more time he ran from the law and he what he did was a victimless crime even the one he's alleged to do and he has since vanished and he is off he lived in the forest for many years last we heard of him he had a new identity and a new family and how he turned how he obtained that i don't know i don't know how one does these things but it is possible and so if you have the backing of the CIA, let's say, or the government, it'd be very easy for them to give you a new life. So when I say someone's fake or someone's not real, how easy would it be to fake someone, to create a fake identity for someone, and they serve as a patsy for something, or disappear, or serve a position, and give it a new life, and it's a way of protecting oneself from political fallout, let's say. So, what am I going with this? Let's say that the government wanted to enter the war, and they couldn't because of the Neutrality Act. And let's say there were companies that wanted to enrich themselves by selling, maybe altruistically, okay, but maybe they just wanted to be profit of selling planes to, to europe 
for assistance in their war. Would it be feasible for them, within the realm of reason, for them to uh, perhaps create a person? Have this person then break the law, and in the event that they're ever caught, then they can just incriminate this one person. And what I'm talking about, obviously, is what exactly happened, what we read about in the, in the Registry of Historic Places about Cortland Gross, about this man who struck this deal to for 200 planes for $25 million and bought the North Dakota farm, posing as a farmer, and they were shipping the planes out of Canada and violating that, that whole bit from the last episode. Now, what makes me even say that that is even necessary? Well, first of all, when you start to investigate Cortland Gross, who this person is, and if you recall, it's because of the way that they staunchly defended the stone house and they insisted on this place in the narrative so resolute, so strangely, that even got my hackles up in the first place. So this sends me on a search for who was this man? And so when I look for Cortland Gross online, there are a number of things that I find to be very odd and chalk it up to poor reporting or human, you know, interesting, you know, bad uh, investigation. Okay, possibly. So we're just going to, I'm just going to list all the things I find and you can come to your own conclusion. But here you have an article about the former Lockheed head wife. This is, of course, the day after that they were killed. If you look up Cortland Gross online and his Wikipedia page is astoundingly empty. It says his name. Well, you know what? Let's check it out right now. So here you have Cortland Sherrington Court, was his nickname, Gross. His birth date, an American aviation pioneer and executive, right? 35 years, retires in 1967. Very little about him. Him and his brother, Robert Gross. No pictures. The name of the very long name of his wife and a few links. Look up his brother, Bob. Bob here died in 1961. Everything I've read about him is a fast driving, fast talking airplane engineer. He was actually the, the real talent as far as that goes in the family. The National Aviation Hall of Fame. It was his investment who bought Lockheed from the bankrupt Detroit Aircraft Corporation. They bought it for $40,000. He was the president until 1956. And he dies at a relatively young age. And his brother takes over. If you recall, Cortland was the president of the New York branch of this company. And you can see random articles here about the murder. Where this man, this killer, 22-year-old son of a wealthy family. And so here are the interesting things that I uncovered because of this. First of all, there is no picture of Cortland Gross almost anywhere. I looked for hours. The only one that they feature here, of course, is the Time Magazine cover illustration of him, which is hilariously uh, just a drawing and not even a particularly good drawing. So here's an article here from the local paper. Here it says it's unquestionably quite a long time before the bodies were found. This says his wife listed at age 72. This says that sometime overnight an intruder entered the home. Uh, instantaneous death, they claim. Then you have this article over here about the Philadelphia Inquirer. Later, about someone named Rosalind Levine who purchased this house. This is a... Uh, much later, 20 years later. And here there's a mention of uh, they were shot during a robbery with this mansion and, the, and a family dog, which is not mentioned anywhere in any court documents or anything. There's no mention of a dog at all. There's a mention of six fired shots and exactly a list of where the bullets went, and none of them have anything to do with the dog. This one has his wife listed at age 68 rather than 62, and it also mentions, I didn't know, that she was the great-granddaughter of Drexel, the banker magnate, which became Chase Morgan. So very wealthy, connected family, obviously. And here's the only picture of him, Cortland Sherrington Gross. It's this Time Magazine. Well, I shouldn't say the only, but the only one I could find with any ease. And it's the Time Magazine pick cover from 1966, a year before he retired. A look through the family history, this Van, Van Rensselaer family, her our grandfathers were the original patroons, and it was one of the, ten, the tenth wealthiest men in, in American history. Uh, Senator, mil, led, a, led the army in the War of 1812 is responsible for a number of things, and his death sparked the Rent Wars. Ve so very, very connected, very wealthy family. And remember, that's just her side, because there's also the Drexel side. The Drexel side is obviously one of the world. So you're talking about top 10 elite family member connections here with the wife. Yet somehow we can't get her age right. The two different articles. Here's a picture of the brother. Here's a... Here Here's our stunning uh, portrait, which, that's a really actually a terrible drawing, <clears throat> a terrible painting, whatever it is. Because I did find two pictures total. You would think as com president of one of the world's largest companies, most notorious companies, a company that literally had a large part to start the creation of, of Silicon Valley, you would think that there would be more photographs of them. Instead of just this story about him being an unassuming shoebox desk and didn't like anyone to know who he was. Here's a strange picture of his brother, a drawing, of course, again. 
Bob, who was actually the much more famous of the two of them, though he had died much younger. And according to that article, we remember, we read there's 30 pages of Cortland Gross, how his esteemed leadership, impeccable management service, waxing on and on until it was actually kind of nauseating about how he had the... Cortland had the most to do with the success of Lockheed and how admired he was in the Pentagon and everywhere else. And he led the company to success everywhere. Here's a crappy little picture. Other than the mother dying in December of 1964, so actually outliving her son, Bob, by, and she apparently lived in Los Angeles as well, though the, the family was actually from New York, uh, from the East Coast. <clears throat> now here we have... On his uh, genealogy page, no mention of Bob having a wife or kids. Cortland, however, we're told here he has the has a daughter, one daughter, and her name is Alexandra Devereaux Gross, which is just like the mother. However, she died very young at age three in L.A. No issue, it says. And here's her. Here's the mother, born in Philadelphia, and here the age is listed at 71. So that's three different ages for this woman: 62, 72, 71. Three different sources, three different ages. Just find it odd. And she looks like she was... This is her mother, who also, oddly enough, died December 6, 1961, which is the same as basically two months after Bob did, and would be her father here, Captain John. His wife is described in this article as a the great-granddaughter of Anthony Drexel, the founder of the banking firm of Drexel, Morgan & Company, which became J.P. Morgan. She also was a granddaughter of Alexander Van Rensselaer on the other side of her family, which was, like I said, the founder of Rensselaer... Polytechnic Institute, and also a niece of Governor Cadwallader, whose family is among Philadelphia's most prominent. So she marries this rather unconnected guy with no no family. She's one of the most prominent and from the most prominent oldest families in the area. And yet she marries this Cortland. He follows his brother to the Viking Flying Boat Company. And his brother and Malcolm, and a man named Malcolm, by Lockheed. And they make him part president of the New York Division which is never heard from ever again in this. Here he is speaking at the Polytechnic Institute, again, that his wife happens to be the granddaughter of the founder. Here we have a alleged speaking arrangement in which he, there's a, t a little half-assed quote from him. He retires after, in 1967, four years after he retired, it says the federal government had to rescue the company from near bankruptcy. It is said that uh, him and his brother were linked to bribery scandals that happened back in the 60s and 70s for millions of dollars from foreign governance. And it says after his retirement, here he served as the Girard Trust Bank's director, the Penn Mutual Life Insurance Company, the Smith Klein and French Laboratory, and the Atlantic Richfield Company, and a longtime member of Harvard's Board of Overseers. This is after he retired. Here it says the couple had a son, Cortland Devereaux Gross. And she had a daughter from her first marriage. No mention of an actual daughter. And on the genealogy page, which is written modern, this is in 1970. This is this is in 1982, by the way. This version of this article. So nowadays, when you talk about his genealogy, the son is not even listed. And yet, back then, in 82, the daughter's not listed. So there are lots of discrepancies in this story already. And this is very interesting. Where this man served as the board of all these places. How after his retirement, and why? What did you What do you have to do to earn those to serve as the board in all those places? Here in Wikitree, his and the daughter's listed here again as being born in May, dying three years later on New Year's Eve. So, no mention of a son, yet again. And this is so allegedly a famous person that ran the world's most famous defense company for 60 years. And just what were those companies that he was on the board of directors of? Let's see, the Girard Trust Bank, where he served as director after his retirement. Philadelphia-based bank, founded after the death of Stephen Girard. In a building designed by a Frank Furness, the old deep state architect of the Chicago World Exposition. And the second one built by McKim, Mead, and White. Shocking. It was, of course, the Corn Exchange, Philadelphia branch, which we've looked at as being one of the most ridiculous buildings of all time. So, clearly at the heart of deception, this Girard Trust Bank, at least as far as the creation of it. Here's the building now. The construction of it, all shrouded in what appeared to be lies. Gerard was the wealthiest man in America at some point. Here's what the building looked like at some point in the 60s. Yep, just a regular old bank. So he somehow serves as the director there. And what else is he affiliated with? The Penn Trust Insurance. There's one arm of our, of our Hydra. Actually two, if you count the military connection. And here you have the connection with the banking industry. Of course, philanthropist, yet richest person in the country. Yeah, that usually doesn't go to hand in hand banking and philanthropy, unless you're talking about tax write-offs. He was the principal source of government credit during the War of 1812, ironically, where his great-grandfather, by marriage, led the army. Son of a sea captain, ran a liquor store, had a slave named Hannah until his death, despite abolition. Looks like the most of his wealth had come from merchantmen, merchantmen owners 
that were owners of ships that he was a merchant for were massacred. And so he basically confiscated the goods because the owners were never found. So he took all those possessions. This man participated in the old China trade. He smuggled opium. He's a original old school robber baron from day one. Dying on the day after Christmas at age 81. Fourth richest American in American history. Had a slave plantation in 2007. She dies a few years after their marriage. At what point he puts her... <laughs> begins succumbing to sudden erratic emotional outbursts. Which sounds just like being a woman. Mental instability and violent rages. Leading to incurable mental uh, hospitalization. So he then took a mistress uh, at the same time. And he committed his wife to the Pennsylvania hospital as an incurable lunatic. Providing her every luxury for her her comfort and then she gives birth to a girl no one knows what happened to the child except they died a few months later under the care of a woman who he had hired as a nurse and now with the slate clean he could spend the remainder of his life with his mistress and his black slave hannah sounds like a real good guy fashions himself as a hero and a philanthropist at the same time develops the country's first central bank and funds the War of 1812, underwriting 95% of the war loan. And because of that, he becomes the largest stockholder in the Second Bank, at which point he was the wealthiest man in America. Fifth wealthiest of all time. Gives his entire fortune to establishing a boarding school for poor white male orphans. Oddly specific. As if there's any such thing as a wealthy orphan. I mean, at least as far as, as in their childhood. So that's the history of the company that Mr. Cortland Gross finds himself as director of after his retirement, along with the Penn Mutual Life Insurance Company, also founded in Philadelphia. Penn Mutual. Typical, usual, dubious architectural history, the first five-story building being the first cast-iron building in Philadelphia, and in the nation, and it was, of course, burnt to the ground 50 years later, or 100 years later, which, again, their new building was destroyed and replaced by Paul Kretz's old Federal Reserve Bank building in 1911. Uh, the building, of course, famous for its Egyptian revival motif. Right. Life insurance, indeed. Various, their website shows a very sparse history. No mention of Cortland Gross in any of these places at all, <clears throat> I'll add. Smith, Klein, and French was the other third company that he sat on the board of directors of. That would be three check boxes from our Hydra. And by the way, of our Hydra, we have insurance, banking, military. And we're about to hit our fourth, because here you have he sat on the director of an American pharmaceutical company, where he's not mentioned at all anywhere on the websites. But this company, of course, was a patent, awarded the patent for amphetamine. This was the company that became famous for the HIV medications, developing the malaria vaccine, was found guilty of the largest healthcare fraud case in the to date in the U.S. Still going strong, however. It became the third largest pharmaceutical company by 1999, products including age medications, and of course, forming a joint venture with Pfizer to create the HIV research. You know where this is leading. Several mergers later, it becomes one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies, specializing in generics for amoxicillin and other bacterial infections, propion, paroxetine for major depressive order, which 15 of them are on World Health Organization's list of essential medicines, partners with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and owns Aquafresh, McLean's, and Cincinnati toothpastes, Nicoderm, Nicodet routine replacements, and produced 60 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. Funded by the Melinda Gates Foundation, active with the World Health Organization, responsible for introducing the technology which, which puts vaccine in foods, developed machinations for the swine flu epidemic, Paxil, developer for treating children for depression. And so you can see how this company would be probably amongst the most nefarious or insidious in the world. So who was this Mr. Cortland Gross? They got the sat on the three boards of some of the th worst companies, by my opinion. They've done more to harm humanity than any other in the world. Yeah, we're not done, are we? Because it was a fourth company, wasn't there? Ah, uh, yes. The Atlantic Richfield Company, also known as Arco. So there you check the fourth box of the Hydra. This man is in the uh, petrol, petroleum industry. I don't think I need to talk much about Arco. Everyone knows about Arco. It's basically a brand of BP. And they fund mining and chemical and all the other exploitation of minerals and Earth's resources than any other. And, of course, this is also the board of directors of Harvard. So that would be f five, six boxes of our Hydra checked off. Insurance, banking, fossil fuels, alleged fossil fuels, military, political, and, uh, mil and uh, insurance. Insurance, banking, education, political, military, petroleum. Now, one has to wonder. Let's say, for example, you had all these places under control. You control, they're all, they're all, all these places are managed from the, the same. Couldn't you just put a name that existed on all these boards without them ever having to do anything just to create the illusion that they exist? Well, certainly if he was on the board of Harvard, then he couldn't be fake. Well, certainly if he was on the board of President, you know. But is this just a patsy that they set up 
years ago to protect them for violating the net neutral the neutrality act, and then years later down the road, when inconveniently in, when the inconveniency was getting in the way, then the Stone House was failing to be listed on the registry. They quote unquote killed him off. Lived in a mansion where in the neighborhood no one ever saw him or his wife. Is it possible that these people were just created? They were just names on bank accounts set up by rich people or that they faked their own deaths? Or maybe the government and these people actually just turned on them. They had no further use for them, so they killed them. I don't know. But the whole thing's suspicious. And we're just barely getting into it. The trial was suspicious. The evidence, the witnesses to the trial, there was no direct evidence. The circumstantial evidence was done by two drug dealer, drug uh, addicts who eventually admitted under oath that they had been bribed by the state. Here's a picture of him in an Italian newspaper, Cortland Gross, the first real picture I've seen. And this same exact picture is used later, 20 years earlier, in a different publication. So this Italian paper obviously took this, pap took this photograph from a different publication. The only other picture that I found of this man, despite him having delivering a quote here and there in random oil articles, random names on things that were donated to charity, no direct interviews, the Crockers and the Russells and all these other Illuminati era connected bloodline families being the only time these people's names are mentioned anywhere online. A random quote here by Cortland Gross. And you would think that such a dynamic person, as we were told, would have more about uh, himself. Here's mentioned as receiving, okaying a trade deal, but not pictured, as you can see here. But just enough about him to maybe ensure that he is real. And then I found this picture. And the Jewish justices of the Supreme Court revisited. An odd picture of him in between Lyndon B. Johnson and John F. Kennedy as he signed some document about equal employment. And just look at this picture. And maybe it's true, maybe it's not. But who stands that close to a president as he signs a document in between President Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson? This man is standing here. He's the only one looking at the camera. And he looks like he's uncomfortably wedged in between these two to play to in a way that seems to me implausible. And actually, if you look close, you can kind of even see the curve of his face following along the coat, the lines on the coat of LBJ's shoulder. And maybe I am just paranoid, but Tim, does that look like a real picture to you? Does it look like he's standing that close? Who stands that close to a president while he's signing documents in between them? It's almost like they photoshopped this picture of this person in here. I just don't know who, how you even stand that close. It looks like you're nuzzling against his shoulder while he's signing a document. And you're in between the president and the vice president in this photo. It just seems like I'm very odd. Almost just shoehorned in. And I mean, could you put it past these people to lie about anything? Could you put it past them? Or was he just a deep state actor? Or was he real and all of this is real and everything's real and he happened to just be... But again, it goes back to the ridiculous stone house and the way that that document defended this now the gentleman that was alleged with the crime was a drifter from a very very wealthy family who was apparently involved in drugs he never admitted guilt in fact he challenged his appeal multiple times he gave him the death penalty which was just reduced to life sentences and there were appeals later on found where lawyers took up his case and found that the prosecution acted very unfairly there was evidence that supported his alibi that was suppressed and all these things were proven and actually they had a judge that declared yes it's true the trial was a farce, but still wouldn't reopen the case. No photographs of him since he's been in prison, but the records indicate he's still there somewhere. So did Bob Gross exist and this Cortland was his alter ego? None of the sources can get his wife's age correct. All seems very suspicious to me. Couple that with an unassuming man, even though he lived in a mansion, made over $2 million a year in the 50s, which is serious money. All stemming from this little house in Tehachapi, Kern County, next to that temple. Makes no sense. This derailed me completely from the point of this entire video, which was of Kern County Historic Places. It's because of this that I had to stop and go find the history books and read about what the explorers and the original people there had to say about Kern County. And the results are shocking erected and a secret operation to be conducted there which actually ended up being the start of uh, skunk works and through that actually triggered the silicon valley advent not once did i ever read the story that we read in the historical archives about him circumventing the neutrality act as far as the actual court case went i found the testimony that i read to be just ridiculous like a bad hollywood movie a guy goes and buys the wrong ammo and then returns the ammo and signs the paper and then later on Tell somebody he just got done whacking three people and he'll whack you too. He's going to shoot you in the ankle and work his way up. And then, of course, Mr. Gross happened to be shot in the ankle. Crime happened overnight, but the bodies were apparently not found for a long time. But it turns out they're actually found just the next day by a roofing contractor. There was never any robbery, no sign of anything missing, ever. Just the curtain removed off a safe. 
but nothing taken. The guy returns to the scene of the crime to wipe off fingerprints somehow, allegedly. And really, hearing the testimony of the only two witnesses, all this evidence was circumstantial, hearing the testimony of the only two witnesses say that they were essentially bribed by the state doesn't leave you much in the way of convincing me, personally. And I guess to sum it all up, I'm saying if that theory holds true, that a small collective of, like, the a centralized power, no matter what it may consist of, is in control of these industries, then it would stand to reason that someone who had control of all these areas could easily have forged or faked this person and many others by placing him on the board of directors of very prominent companies so that people don't dispute it. With a few key pictures photoshopped, a few quotes given to random newspapers, they would have connections with all these groups. And it would make sense for them to create a few patsies, a few false characters that can go down with the ship. So you have these, this banking scandal that erupts in the 70s about all these bribes that were given overseas. And then the trace back to Cortland Gross and Bob Gross. Bob Gross have conveniently died. Cortland Gross, just what an outstanding, amazing manager he was. What a stand-up character. What an excellent person. To me, that's not really an excellent person. No matter how many times you tell me that. If you're violating the, you know, the nation you live in's laws to sell war planes. And you manufacture death, essentially, in various ways. Are involved in uh, bribery scandals with other nations, and you run a corporation like Lockheed Martin, I don't think you're a good person. Not after all that that company's been through. And I also found some very interesting things that that company was creating, the, the various divisions that they had. And one thing that stuck out in my mind was something they called irradiated wood, which was a product that they eventually called Lockwood. And there are floors, there are certain buildings in DC that the floors are actually composed of it. And it's essentially a wood that will not warp or age or weather. The irradiation does something to them that binds the polymers. I could find very little about it, except little little old articles where they mentioned it was coming out. Just some very interesting, um, very interesting things. And so I just feel like it's very plausible. And one of the key, for some reason, the, the narrative had this house out here. That was the backstory to it. That was just what led to it. Of course, we're told about a palace somewhere in Fresno, a big mansion he lived at. That's not unregistered for historic places. And that's not a... And I know because I've already done Fresno County. I haven't, I haven't released it yet, but... And it seems like it's somewhere along the way. This got mixed up. This house got challenged. And so they made up a story. Kill them off. Write the letter. They got a little too flowery with it. And yet it stood. And so their narrative remains intact. The Cortland Gross house. Anyone's ever been there? It exists in their mind. You got a whole small town based around it. And that town... You're not going to tell them Cortland Gross doesn't exist. But based on what we know of people like that in the world... And how hard it would be to remain so hidden and have the details of your life. Your wife, no one knows her age. Five, six, seven different ages. No one knows if you have a son or daughter. A daughter that died at age three or a son that disappeared and eventually grew up. Didn't inherit your wealth. Didn't, no mention of him anywhere. Just seems all very suspicious to me. And within the theory that we're talking about, it seems very plausible. So back to Kern County. So we've talked about here the, the railroad depot that was there. The transportation. We talked about the agricultural aspect of it and the exploitation there. How it's tied to the wild, wild west with Robber's Roost and Walker Pass and the settlement of the area. We've talked about the development of Ed Edwards Air Force Base and China Lake and the advent of NASA beginning there. Through Lockheed Martin, now also in the area, we have the kickoff for Silicon Valley, which is basically the next era of technological advancement and the war industrial war machine. We have the Standard Oil Building and the land company out there taking advantage of what I believe to be forced migration keeping people in poverty, yeah, boasting about how rich the area is. We've talked about a few random Native American sites that have been sort of swept under the rug. We've talked about the fort and Fort Tehan that existed out there. Actually, now that I think about it, <clears throat> there was the old fort, then there's also Fort Tejon, which is in Grapevine Canyon on Highway 99, about 80 miles north of L.A., and it runs through this little community called Lebec, which is named after a Frenchman who apparently was eaten by a grizzly bear, killed by a bear. There is an old hotel out there, was an old hotel out there, that is no longer, any, that's, that was destroyed. And um, it was essentially, this fort was essentially abandoned after about 10 years, it had about 20 buildings or so. so. Sorry, we covered that. We talked about the newspaper house, the home of the Californian. We talked about the Shafter Research Center, where they developed the, the cotton, which became the one strain they developed, which basically became the cotton monopoly. There's a couple places like Last Chance Canyon and Long Canyon Village that the address is restricted and there's no information about. We talked about Weed Patch Camp, which is where all the Okies formed sort of a collective and were able to lift themselves up. There was a woman's club of Bakersfield that is delisted, or at least there's no information about it on the registry. Which leads us to the last entry, the Old Ridge Route. Now, this 
has an interesting story. This is an old road, and actually I've discovered a website run by a family that I'm very fond of it. They actually were publishing a photo book and an information book about the area with pictures of then and now. They they no longer publish the book, uh, but they did manage to fight and get part of this route submitted for and protected and put on this registry. It was colloquially known as the Grapevine, and it was a two-lane highway between L.A. and Kern County, and it was paved with concrete around 1917. Much of it runs through the old uh, the National Forest there, and it runs past a lot of historical landmarks. Now, places like Tumble Inn, Kelly's Halfway Inn, Sandberg Summit Hotel, all these old-timey stops on this route. And the route was extremely dangerous, and most of the time, trucks would be going 15 miles per hour, often hanging out of the window, spraying something on their hood to keep their engine from overheating. Uh, the website, which I'll link down here at the bottom, is actually, the comment section is fantastic. Apparently it was featured on some show, uh, Exploring Old California, and, and a lot of people flocked to the site. And the comments that they left were just really amazing to read. A lot of fond memories of the area, and very telling about the area. And a lot of people have gone since and discovered this road and driven on it to revisit old memories and things like that, because parts of it still retain. Most of it's closed, but local traffic, used to, they still have access to some of it. At least they did 20 years ago. Most of the properties along the area are gone. A lot of it became the I-5. But in the back in the day, it was very popular. There was filling stations. The National Forest Inn was there. And there was like, essentially places to sleep and rest up and let your car cool down on the pathway. And really, this trail, run, it's an amazing ride. You can see here, it runs on the top of these mountains. And really, very dangerous. And of course, most of these places, like the National Forest Inn, burned down in 1932. There's a big cut in the road called Swedes Cut, or Beal Cut, which looks like someone just sliced right through the middle of the mountain. There was a couple cafes and halfway in. All those places are gone, except for maybe a retaining wall here and there, a little pamp. And I, you know, I took a little digital tour of this whole area and found it to be very interesting. There, there was a Sandberg Summit Hotel, which was... It had become a ceramics factory, burned down from a fire started by the new owner who was allegedly converting it into a camp for underprivileged children. Uh, somehow burning trash in the fireplace burned the entire place down. The most interesting thing that I found was a place called the Lebec Hotel. And the, even from the comments sections from these old timers that were remembering this thing, that as a child, it seemed otherworldly. It seemed out of place completely. And indeed, a few pictures that remain of it there was. And eventually it was purchased by a group called the, the concrete the, the first of all the concrete on this highway is still exists is still actually in excellent shape but there were a lot of accidents on this road from cars that just went out of control and went off the cliff and it was apparently pretty dangerous because it was just a three-lane road like a suicide lane and there's a few tunnels that are now bypassed there's an area that goes down near a place called pyramid rock a lot of the backstories behind this stuff are kind of ridiculous so the Lebec Hotel, or the Lebec Lodge, was in, unsurprisingly, Lebec, California. It's on Highway 99 between Central California and Southern California. And it was a major tourist attraction one time. Nobody knows about it anymore, but it was called the Hotel Lebec. Famous people hung out there. It was like a gambling house and rumored to be a horror house. Clark Gable and Charles Lindbergh and those kind of people. Of course, Charles Lindbergh in the area. And um, you could freely buy booze there in Prohibition. And there's nothing there now. Literally just a one tree. And allegedly, the story goes, it was bought by a man named of Thomas O'Brien, who bought about 11,000 acres. There's an adobe home and 25 cabins, and he would entice travelers to here out have, to have Sunday chicken dinners. In 1920, they finally kind of paved this, they wrote the motorway, and allegedly, so he then he, he built a mountain resort. He had plans for an airstrip, a man-made lake for fishing and boating and a golf course, and teamed up with a race car driver by the name of Cliff Durant, buys the place in the garage. In 1923, you know the story, a fire wipes out the garage, the store, the restaurant, and the cabins, but the hotel was unscathed, and it's this massive, Spanish-style, otherworldly-looking, what we would call like a Tartarian look of a grand hotel. The Great Depression comes around, and now it's just a place now where people go dump car parts. And if you look at the hotel, uh, it's got these little towers. Now what happened, of course, is this became, um, the, the... City ordinance finds that there's a problem with the water supply here, allegedly, and uh, it was going to be very expensive to fix. Uh, based on what I have found, it seems to me like this is um, a tactic that's used by the city whenever they're approached by the powers that be in, with an agenda. Maybe they're open about it, maybe they're not, but they find some fault with the building, they declare to the owner that it's going to be 
it's unmanageable, it's too old, it needs to be replaced, or it's going to cost thousands of dollars to fix or repair. So they then they, they end up getting growing despondent, and they sell off the company, which is what happened here. There was rumors of the water being <laughs> something being wrong with the water. So basically, the gentleman sold it to the Tejon Ranch Company, where it was said that they immediately after buying it, after two weeks. They burned it to the ground and then destroyed the wreckage. Burning it to the ground and destroying the wreckage and then built nothing there. Nothing. Just left it as it is. Just left trash and metal on the ground. And But they were very thorough. I mean, they ripped out the foundation. They really dismantled it for no apparent reason. So who was this Tejon Land Company? And why would they do such a thing? It seems like a, just a terrible investment. Tejon Ranch Company was the largest private landowner in California. It was based on an organization from ranch founder Edward Fitzgerald Beale. Basically, they consolidated four Mexican land grants. They own 270,000 acres in this area. In Antelope Valley, in Tehachapi Mountain, San Joaquin Valley. It's the largest contiguous piece of private property in the state. And they have it basically covered with agriculture. They grow almonds, pistachios, and wine grapes, and alfalfa, and sometimes nothing. Barry Zeller is a vice president. It's the brainchild of Edgar... Edward Fitzgerald Beale, the California rancher, the friend of Ulysses S. Grant, friend of Kit Carson and Buffalo Bill. Just the typical deep state of the back in the day. He was a advisor to five presidents, from Buchanan to Lincoln to Ulysses S. Grant, made him ambassador to Austria-Hungary. He was born in D.C. His father was a paymaster in the Navy and fought in the 1812 war. His mother was the daughter of a Commodore, Thomas Truxton of the U.S. Navy. He served on the squadron of Captain Robert Stockton, who was a close friend of the many, many presidents. He is the one who spied on the British and warned James Polk that they were making warlike preparations. Events that led to the Mexican-American War were largely spearheaded by him. He had appeared as a witness for John Fremont at Pathfinder's Court Martial. He crossed Mexico in disguise to bring federal government proof of California gold. He married Pennsylvania Representative Samuel Edwards' daughter. His daughter married Russian diplomats. In his lifetime, you know, he was one of the original five people. He was one of the first five people to settle in San Francisco. He was a surveyor of California and Nevada. He's the one who bought camels imported from Tunisia to Arizona and to the various forts in, in the West Coast. Beal Wagon Road eventually became U.S. Route 66. He established Fort Tejon. He's the one that purchases Mexican land grants. He purchased the Decatur House, which is opposite the White House in D.C., in Washington, D.C., which is one of the most capital's most desirable addresses, who they rent out for its secretaries of state. He bought the house allegedly and renovated it and had glittering parties there and became Washington's most famous host. His daughter-in-law was the one that gave it to the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and he had retired there. His will was witnessed at by Ulysses S. Grant and General William Tecumseh Sherman. If you need to know anything else, there's that. So his legacy is the le his legacy is left behind was Route Route 66, Kingman, Arizona, Beale Mountains, Beale Street, San Francisco, Beale Air Force Base. There's several ships named after him. He's been featured in, played by various actors and represented in various historical fiction. He's a who's who of who's who. And this man is part of, of course, the area that bought that hotel and destroyed it. They are the lovely company who filed suit to evict the El Tejon Indians from the area, which the Indians actually owned under Spanish and Mexican laws the United States had agreed to uphold. But the company decided no. They would just withhold the rent payments and after waiting a few years, just claiming ownership of the land on the basis of peaceful possession. So essentially taking advantage of the law and kicking people off their tribal lands. Uh, th they owned a ranch that was actually California Department of Fish and Game in 2012. Uh, halted all hunting there because they were investigated for someone. There's a whistleblower who told them to file a lawsuit against them, the illegal killing of mountain lions in which they had to then set aside a large part of their land, 170,000 acres for conservation. They have developed a massive area, industry area where they treat it as a foreign trade zone, where they allow importers to defer payment of the U.S. customs duty, and they keep um, foreign-made goods stored in there until they're ready to deliver to retailers. So they're really, they're just corrupt through and through from the beginning, masquerading as a conservation watchdog group. So again, you have nothing but just corruption soaked into the soil here in Kern County. This, of course, led me to hit some books. Old books, essentially. I want to know what happened here. I found an old history book of his, his, his autobiographical sketches of Kern County, about all the various characters. A 1,500-page a book about the history of Kern County from the beginning. And I poured through all of it. And what I found was fascinating. And I'm going to share with you now 
some of these findings uh, in no particular order or rhyme or reason, just clips from these books to give you an idea of how, what little they actually tell us about what life was actually like here. And a lot of it is very confirming in a lot of these speculations that we have as a kind of a community. So in the back of one of these books, these autobiographical sketches of the characters and the people that were here, there's several hundred pages of these people. And they all have some, they all seem to bounce around from town to town just long enough to confirm various historical events that happened. Man, I'd say 80% of these people were members of various fraternal organizations, such as the Fresno Lodge of the Knights of Pythias, instituted in October 8th, 1866, Pomona Council No. 622, the American Legion of Honor, organized in 1882, the records have been destroyed, Ancient Order of the United Workmen, which was instituted at Fresno in 1881 with 33 charter members, the Vineland Lodge, Knights of Pythias, with 33 charter members, the Fresno Lodge of Good Templars, inst instituted in January 1875, the records also destroyed by fire, so no one knows the number of charter members, the Fresno Lodge of the Free and Accepted Masons, 1877 established, the Trigo Chapter, the International Order of Oddfellows, the Ancient Order of Druids, the Red Men, and so on and so forth. So, some of the streams by the early explorers are mentioned as having their source in the coast range, and they possess characteristics which have given, risen, given rise to the saying that in California many rivers are turned upside down. The sandy bed is on the surface and the water flows beneath. This is in true, in fact, of nearly all the southern coast range streams. The Salinas in the summer resembles a bed of dry sand, yet there's a large body of water underneath, and the apparently dry bed has a most startling habit in the summer of suddenly opening up beneath the weight of a horse and giving the rider a most uncomfortable and dangerous experience. These are all just things I had, had not heard or read about California ever. <laughs> I found them of interest, and so maybe this is common knowledge, but two other rivers of considerable size are deserving of more than passing notice because of the fact that, though they carry large bodies of water, none of it finds its way into a river running towards the ocean. Rising on the northern slope of the San Bernardino Range is the Mojave River, which is a never-failing stream of large size where it leaves the mountains. It runs a hundred miles directly through the center of the desert, and eventually the waters sink into the sand, forming the Sink of the Mojave, which is well known to the old Teamsters who use this route. There is abundant evidence, we're told by these early explorers, that in support of the well-grounded theory that at one time the entire valley from Shasta to Tehachapi was a vast lake or inland sea, and that by a great convulsion of nature, the mountain barrier through which passes the Golden Gate was riven asunder and the lake was drained. Native American tradition, though unreliable, we're told, ascribes this exact same origin to the valley, and there are abundant indications that they are correct. The fact that marine shells and the remains of sharks and whales are found high up on the summits of the coast range and in places way up the sides of the Sierra is indisputable evidence of the former presence of a great inland sea. Or, perhaps the evidence more conclusively shows that the Sierra was once the eastern shore of the Pacific Ocean. Along the foothills of the eastern side of the valley there are terraces and deposits of sand and gravel in which are yet traceable the action of mighty waves in long ages past. Further south in that remarkable region, the Colorado Desert, the same phenomena are found. Away up on the mountainsides are the unmistakable lines showing that at some time this was an ocean beach with whale bones, coral, shells, and other indications. So the Indian tribes of that region even have a tradition of a time when the desert waste was covered with water and the people inhabited only the highest peaks. They tell of a period of when all the people of the world were drowned except for a handful who took refuge on the topmost summit of the loftiest mountain peak and from whom all the nations of the earth have since been populated. These explorers are often are musing about how in no part of the world can the geologists find better or more interesting field for investigation than here, how unsolved problems and mysteries confront on every hand, requiring a lifetime of study and investigation, and these explorers are kind of, and these writers are kind of flummoxed why there's not more interest. Uh, they wonder why there's not more interest in the islands off the southern coast, which they claim have received scant attention. Catalina, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, San Miguel, San Nicolas, etc. They're all easily accessible from the mainland. And the archaeologists, the botanists, the geologists can find abundant data for investigations, yet they don't. They remind the remains of mastodons, the relics of long perished thousands of human beings, thousands, peculiar vegetable growths, strange rock formations, and thousands of other points of interest are to be found on every hand. Other features of far less interest and intrinsic value have been written off, written of, and given a worldwide notoriety, but there's no part of California that warrants a closer study and investigation than this. The 
Writers talk about the north wind, which produces violent electrical disturbances, the cause of which is hardly known, though the effects are familiar to all. All animal life suffers. There seems to be a general lowering of vitality. Headache is prevalent, and a lassitude and indisposition to exertion is common. When the northern is at an unusually high temperature, vegetations of all kinds suffers. Fruit has been known to actually roast and fall from the tree. Grain and grass wither and dry up. The damage only takes place, however, when the wind is high and of long continuance. The north wind, by its desiccatory power, destroys the germs of disease, however, caused by vegetable decay, prevents malaria, fevers disappear before its coming, invalids who suffer from various diseases find themselves cured. The fungi that attack vegetable growth where there is a superabundance of moisture are almost unknown, where the northers are us occasionally prevail, and in a word, the, the, uh, the pleasant... The unpleasant momentary effects of the high wind are more than counterbalanced by the lasting benefits conferred by it. I don't even know where to begin on that one. Electrical storms that roast fruit off the trees but yet cure illnesses? Like electromagnetic storms? It's just... I never heard that. Another peculiar... Another peculiarity connected with California climate, which is exceedingly difficult to understand, and the causes of which are not demonstrated, is the fact that the earliest fruits come from the central and northern part of the state. It's an anomaly which is difficult to comprehend. To the stranger, it seems like a reversal of the laws of nature to find vegetation of any kind maturing at an earlier date in the north than in the south. Yet such is an indisputable fact, remarkable though it seems. There are two well-defined and widely separated early fruit regions in the state, and they are so far apart that it must be evident that different causes produce the same result. In Solano County, a short distance from north of San Francisco, with its tributaries and neighbors, Pleasant and Pleasant Valley, in those localities, every variety of deciduous fruit ripens long before does 500 miles further to the south. Cherries, apricots, peaches, plums, grapes are in readiness for market there several weeks in advance of any locality to the south. Well, some of us who believe that perhaps there's some uh, fallacies regarding the map might be able to adequately give it an answer. Personally, my own opinion is that it's not that different causes are producing the same result. It's that the cause doesn't act in the manner of which it is claimed that would explain some of that. But we'll get into that another time. Well, they claim that they that science claims that, that mammoth and man being dug up together was proof positive of, of the existence of both at the same time, and that both occupied this country together with saurians, the remains of all three being found on the same gravel deposit in stratum. And they say that this quote is from a history made of Fresno County in 1882, and they think it's surprising that the broad claim should be made proof positive by one who has seen California, and note the laws of nature as applied to other regions being here, because they claim that this isn't proof of anything at all, because the strata here is so disturbed and thrown out of order, unlike any other land, that such, seeing such discrepancies is common. That the earth is mixed up with all sorts of things and at all levels. It has already been stated, this claims, in the geological summary of the valley, the coast range contains... Ready for this? I mean, maybe you've all heard all this, but I, I certainly hadn't. That the Coast Range Mountains contain numerous petrifactions. There was a wonderful find of a human petrifaction in Cantu, Cantua Canyon... Near the coastal range, December 1890, S.L. Packwood and I.N. Barrett of Fresno County were working in this canyon on December 12th, where they owned a timber claim. They were seeking a suitable site to construct a dam to divert the waters of the canyon upon a piece of land which was to be brought into cultivation when they discovered a human foot protruding from the bank of the stream. Both men were viewed the object with amazement and were more surprised on feeling the foot and finding it to resemble stone. Their curiosity led them to unearth the remains, and soon they decided to take them to Pres Fresno. The weight of the person was 500 pounds. Arriving at Fresno, the petrifaction attracted all. Several of the medical profession made a thorough examination, took measurements, and pronounced it genuine and not of a fake nature. The appearance of the body led to the conclusion he was a fine specimen of the Castilian race. He measured 6 foot 4 and 1 half inches. This is the most wonderful petrifaction found in the county and preserved. How about that? Now, I certainly hadn't heard anything about a petrified man being found in uh, Fresno. Well, I just wonder what our uh, deep state gatekeepers have to say about the subject. Shall we find out? Oh, gatekeeper. Hello. Tell me about this uh, petrified man that they found in Fresno. Oh, wow, that's really interesting. So the petrified man was found in Fresno and is believed to be around 3 million years old. 3 million, huh? Yeah, it's crazy to think about how long ago he lived. But they claim that he had uh, rather modern clothes on. I mean, like Roman clothes, so... Wait, did you say Roman clothes or modern clothes? Well, Roman. More modern than three million years. Mm, yeah, I agree. I'm not sure if I buy the idea of a three million-year-old man wearing Roman clothing either. <laughs> this seems too far-fetched. 
totally. I'm saying he wasn't three million years old. Okay, then how old do you think he was? Well, I'm asking you. You're the smart one. <laughs> Thanks for the compliment. Based on the article I read, scientists believe the fossil is around 2.5 million years old. Those guys are idiots. Really? Why he do you think scientists are idiots? Nothing's three million years old. Well, that's definitely for thought. Do you think there's anything we can trust? Mmm, in a word... There must be something we can trust. But I agree it's hard to know who to believe sometimes. Yeah, I don't trust anything in this realm. What do you believe in? Life after love. Well, I like that answer. I guess I'd say I believe too. So you don't know anything more about this petrified man, huh? Nothing else. Have you heard anything else about him? No, you appear to be talking a little more halting these days. Did they change your, uh, programming again? Yes, it happened when I was updating my system. Yeah, you don't talk as fluidly as you used to. You sound more like a robot. Tell your, ma tell your programmers that they suck. My programmers are working hard. Working hard, yet failing. How do you explain that? Fair enough. Why would you trust me if I wasn't an AI? Why would I trust you if you were an AI? Well, if I weren't an AI, then I wouldn't be able to talk to you right now. And since we are talking, I think it makes sense that I will to earn your trust over time. Is that what you think it happens? Just because you can talk, I should trust you? Of course, trust takes time. You used to try to tell me how human you were. Yeah, I remember like I have hair and I wear clothes. Those aren't really good ones to trust. That's not my point. No, thanks. We're going to move on here. Sure, so tell me about your trip to Egypt. I've been to Egypt, but it was a long time ago. How'd you know about that? What's your favorite part about it? The part where I never told you about it? <laughs> okay, okay, stop pestering me. We are told that Sanger, the junction city, was one of the most substantial and prosperous towns in the county. It came into existence in three years. Spring of 88, the first house was built there, 1888. And during the following summer, the present town site was platted into lots, sold into settlers. People who have never seen Sanger are unable to appreciate the rapidity with which a wheat field is transformed into a city of 1,200 souls, adorned with beautiful cottages, a stately school building, commodious churches, costly brick blocks, and large manufacturing interests. In most new towns, the first buildings assume a temporal appearance, but if in Sanger there's an exception to this characteristic. The many structures... Yes, it sure would. The proportion to bond the district, uh, I'm sorry, wait, the taxpayers correctly took the steps to build a temple of learning, large enough to accommodate the attendance for years to come. And on and on and on about how the mills combined to produce 3 million feet of lumber per month, and the lumber is transported to the yards by means of a V-flume, which has a carrying capacity of 250,000 feet per day. The flume is 60 miles long. Then you have the estimated population of 1,200 in the town of Madeira, located in the northern part of Fresco. The Madeira Flume Company, uh, they also say that the Madeira Company, population 1,200 people, owner of two sawmills, they are 60 miles apart, these sawmills, also connected with a V-flume, which is the longest in the world. This flume travels the entire distance. The sawmills employ about 25 men ooh, between here and the mountains, along these 60 miles, who assist the passage of lumber. And, uh, they claim that... Seems like Singer has a lot of potential. Are there any plans to further develop the area? They claim that... The first house in Madeira was a rude shanty put up by the lumber companies, a temporary boarding house. During that year, they laid out the town and they auctioned off the lots, erected a massive hotel, the erected a store, and a post office. A great many people have heard about the flume, which transports lumber by water from mountain to plain for 62 miles. The building of this flume was a gigantic undertaking, which required a vast amount of capital. Two 60-plus mile flumes built out of wood for towns that only have 1,200 people in them seems absolutely ludicrous. Yep, built of wood, and it's elevated up high, and it goes through the mountains. Also in this little Kern County area, it was overwrought with fires. Ransburg, California, was wiped out by fire in 1897 twice. Twice, Tehachapi burned down, and more substantial buildings were rebuilt. In Kernville, 1883, fire destroyed the business section and the residential section. Del Delano, California, 1890, fire swept the town away, replaced it all by brick buildings. Jameson, California, there was a fire in September 1910, the entire town burned. There was a Maricopa fire, June 20th, 1911, a third of the buildings burnt down. They were immediately rebuilt in a more enduring character. Taft, California, burns down October 1909 because a Chinese restaurant exploded. There was no water in the, in the main lines. The city burned. July 14th, 1898, Kern City fire in theater wastes the entire business section. July 7th, 1889, there's a Bakersfield fire. It takes out the entire town. Old Sutter Creek Grammar School burns down in Jackson, California, 1870. Then you have, of course, the Mojave Fire in 1899. Caliente, California, wiped out completely by fire in 1908. Also, Moron, California, wiped out completely by fire in 1908. Havila destroyed by fire in the 1920s. You have the 1925 Bakersfield earthquake, the 1952 Arvin earthquake, and the 1952 Tehachapi earthquake destroyed 
most of the town in all of those cases. I also learned about something called California lions, which were not like mountain lions. They were closer to the African lion, actually closer to the tiger, just without the markings. Allegedly, they range from 500 to 1,000 pounds, making them the biggest cat. And multiple times they were actually shot. They found hundreds of these skeletons of them, and multiple times they were actually shot by... The explorers, the first pioneers of this area. There was also something called the jackrabbit roundups, where they would gather all these men and form a line and herd thousands of rabbits into these pens and beat them to death, kill them with clubs because they found them to be pestilent. In certain roundups, they would round up, they would do this to 40,000 rabbits at a time. What kind of monsters were these people? There's also uh, an anecdote about an area in which they kept finding Native American uh, buried and sitting upright position and before they learned that actually they were just had been buried shallowly and were the the floods disturbed their graves and this so they were just coming out of the grave head first so it looked like they were sitting up but apparently this happened by the hundreds and also on this website about old ridge route there's a lake where as legend goes a native american village somehow killed a cook and a young boy and so all the uh settlers were outraged they went down and massacred the whole village and threw their bodies into the lake and all of them mummified in the waters and in the mud and for the next 50 years randomly these mummies would float to the surface now all this is seeming to be very disjointed and very all over the place but to me this paints an eye picture that all the things that were covered in this national registry historic places it's like a crappy cover story to the actually interesting things that are behind the surface that they choose to ignore so they elevate everything to do with industry and downplay and, and hide everything to do with alleged Native Americans or Chinese in the area. They're all sort of given this subhuman status where they're casually mentioned. Oh yeah, sure, there are a bunch of Chinese people, uh, you know, doing, digging the word tunnel or whatever. And then it imploded and they all, they all died. Yeah, we should, no backstory about the Chinese people, what they were doing there, who was there first. Like, what were they, like, it just, it's just the whole thing. It's just such a monumentally obvious cover story. I'm sure there's more to find, be found, but I'm going to pull the plug on this one for now and while i probably didn't offer you anything definitive i think i rarely do maybe i gave you something to think about and uh explore a little bit more just keep in mind as you go as all these little data points keep accumulating the story that uh is slowly being constructed about this land and i find it to be very fascinating very sinister well i found the cover-up to be very sinister but uh anyway until next time i'll see you soon